There we go. Hi, this is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. And today, as I got a drop of water on my side of my painting already, um, we are going to paint a EO Triceratops. Um, this is E in my uh, Dinobet. And the EO Triceratops, um, basically when I first drew this thing, Lord, a long time ago, um, it was not known as the EO Triceratops. It was known as the EO Ceratops. Now it's the EO Triceratops. Um, somebody found a bigger skull. Um, and that's why it's called that. Um, as I realized, one of the things I want to do is I'm going to start with, I did his horn a little bit incorrectly. So I'm going to use an X-Acto knife. You're going to see, here's the horn that I feel that I just, I, I need to make it thicker and I need to need, Lean, need to make it lean forward a little bit more. So I'm going to take the X-Acto knife and I'm going to scrape away. This is ballpoint pen. Um, I do the, I'm do i doing the underpaintings in these particular watercolors in ballpoint pen because it's very good um, uh, for a base drawing. Um, you can use pencil. You can use traditional India ink is a really good underdrawing. Um, both of those have their advantages. Um, pencil is, is great because it does lay down um, graphite, which is a pigment in clay. So when you're use it, drawing with a, a pencil, it's, it's pretty good and permanent because it is actually, it's like you're laying down stone. Um, you're laying down two minerals. With um, Ballpoint pen is a petroleum distillate. It's made with um, oil. So it's like you're drawing with an oil pen. And it works kind of like crayon resist if you're working in crayon, or sorry, if you're working watercolor, that it will um, basically um, resist the watercolor so it comes through a little bit better. I always go over my um, works at the end to crisp up the line because um, when it comes to edging, if you want to, you can do your edging in watercolor alone without any kind of leave behind line like a pencil or an ink line. But um, I just find it, it a more definitive way to create images and that's why I do it. Okay, now you can see what I'm doing. I've been scraping away with the X-Acto knife blade, and then I'm using a kneaded eraser to pull away that the paper that I've scraped. And then I'll take it down to a little bit finer. And then you come in with a latex eraser, one of your light, white latex eraser, and you scrub it some more. And there's still some small... Um, pieces of paper sticking up. So you take your your knitter, your uh, your um, knife, exacto knife again, and you keep you scrape again away the fibers that are remaining sticking up. And I will do you know go back and forth and up and down to scrape those extra fibers away, and it'll look fluffy, kind of furry. And you go hit it with a kneaded eraser again. That'll take more of those fibers away. And then you hit it with the latex eraser again. And that'll burnish down. The latex eraser helps to burnish down or pull up any fibers that are still there. Now this is Canson, um, 150-pound or 300-gram uh, watercolor paper. Um, it's not as good as Arches. If you're using, I would highly recommend... Um, Fabriano is really good. Arches is really good. This is Canson, and sadly, the Canson has bought Arches. I'm not real happy with their hot press ever since Canson bought it. They bought it, you know, like about what was it? Probably six year, six seven years back, and I've never. It's still good paper, but it's like I think they're they're being stingy with their sizing, or they've changed their sizing. So it's not, I've been, I'm trying to find a good hot press paper. This is cold press. Um, and the difference between hot press and cold press is just what they say. When it's, when they're making the paper in the finishing process, 
they'll heat up the fibers so that the paper will be smoother. If you're using hot press with cold press, there'll be a little bit of roughness paper. Okay, that's probably about the best we're gonna get down on this. One more with the latex, and once more with the kneaded eraser. And that, that basically burnishes the paper down as close as you're gonna get to like the original surface. And there might be a few little hairs left, but it, it won't show all that much. There are some things, and I'll show you what you can do to uh, pull the fibers back. So now I'm going to redo the, this, this horn here. There. That's what I want. I want it a little bit more, a little bit thicker and a little bit leaning more forward. There we go. This one probably should be the same way, but I'm not going to worry too much about that one. As long as the front one's okay. And then I'll come back here, and I'm going to redo some of these lines with the uh, plant fiber. Because it's basically, consider he's, he's in... Um, I was telling uh, in my first video on this, the, the cycads, they're basically plants with, with kind of spiky um, leaves are behind him. And, okay, so we've got that done. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start out with some Prussian blue. Um, and I'm going to lay a light coating of Prussian blue in the background here. And you can see what, what I've done is um, I've basically, um, this is a very thin wash of Prussian blue and I put a lot of water in it and I'm painting wet on dry. The paper itself is dry and the paint is wet. Um, this is opposed to a wet on wet technique is a popular watercolor technique. Um, I do a lot of um, wet on dry or I'll paint into um, wet on wet once I've established um, the initial wash. Okay, so that area right there has been laid down. Now, mind you, some of the stuff like in here, one of the things that watercolor does is it, it will pull back. Um, you'll lay down a puddle of watercolor and as it dries, it'll pull back and leave some gaps of white where you thought, okay, I laid down the watercolor there, but it, it, it'll pull back. And you can either go back into them or um, worry about that later. Now, I'm going to let that blue area dry. Um, it's because I'm going to go back into that with some yellow. And it dries, watercolor dries pretty fast. Um, the advantage to it, it's one of the reasons why I like using it over acrylic or oil, is because it does dry pretty fast. Um, now, on my palette here that you can see, this right here is raw um, sienna. This is raw umber, burnt sienna, burnt umber, um, sepia, uh, um, Payne's gray. Uh, lamp black and Mars black over here in the very corner um, and I won't be using I don't think any black in this particular one I am going to uh, basically do a base color on our um, Cerro Triceratops I'm going to make him a yellowish color and the uh, raw sienna you can use is um, the two colors that um, I like for my, my yellow brown is either a raw sienna or um, yellow ochre. And yellow ochre tends to be a little bit too yellow for me. So I I have a tendency to go more towards um, using the raw sienna over uh, yellow ochre. And I'm going to be really careful about I'm painting close to the edge here. Some of the green, some of the... the, the um, um, Prussian is going to seep in because I haven't quite let that area dry yet. But that's okay. Because that, that little bit of, of uh, greening on that edge 
will just add interest to the, the color. Okay. And you can tell it's dried down here and down here. And this is where I've scraped away that paper. Keep an eye on that while we're, while we're working. And you'll see that there's a little bit of foxing there where we've had a few of the hairs of the paper. And it's partially because of the quality of the paper. Um, this particular Canson is not, I'm like I said, I'm not as fond of um, Canson's version of, of watercolor paper as I am. Um, I'm a big Arches fan, even though Canson owns them now. Um, Arches is... Uh, a French mold paper and um, but the arches I don't think it comes in postcard size and this is actually this is um, literally four by six postcard size and I like to work on pads I like to have pre-cut watercolor paper you can just um, cut watercolor paper if you want to um, you could cut a four by six piece and one of the things I do, I, I don't like um, with the, the water back, back tape that they use normally in watercolor situations to um, hold down my watercolor. I will use scotch tape. I will use, I can scotch tape a uh, painting down. Now here's an interesting thing that you might have happen. I have a cat hair. I have a cat. And if you have cat, cat hair gets everywhere. You can't avoid it. It it gets in everything. It just, that's the way it is. And I just use the brush to pull the cat hair out of my painting. Um, occasionally, if you do get a cat hair in your painting or a dog hair, if you have pets, um, try to pull it out with your brush. Um, normally, it won't cause much problem to your painting when it dries. Sometimes watercolor will puddle under the hair, but it's not something that you really have to worry too much about but uh, with me it's it's an occupational hazard just because I have pets and quite sincerely okay I'm letting this area still dry some more because we did do the um, the surgery in that area this right here if I paint it right now I might get more bleeding in it than I want so I'm gonna play around with um, the rest of the uh, the piece and you can tell it's like this area here is dried this area here it has fully dried this is still a little bit damp and you can tell because when watercolor dries it dries light it paints dark it dries light and the thing is is that the advantage to that is you always want to paint in layers and you want to paint um, light to dark so you always want to paint, you know, your lighter colors first and keep darkening up as you go along if you can. And keep keep your washes light. Um, I usually keep my washes pretty light. I don't um, do my, keep a lot of pigment in the wash. You know, add a lot of water to it. And you can see here what I'm doing is I'm making puddles on the palette. And you'll notice they're not rolling into each other or anything and they're keeping pretty separate and you can come up with more interesting colors by having them in various areas like this on your palette and so this this is where I'm going to now mind you too it's like you can add water to your color and I'm gonna add a little bit more pigment so I pull up the pigment by um, I've got cadmium yellow off screen that I'm using for um, the green that I'm going to use in the, the cycads. And I think I'm going to go with a slightly smaller brush. I'm using um, my Raphael number two right now. Um, uh, this has been a really good brush for me. I use all, when I'm doing watercolor, I use sable brushes, period. I'll either use this as a Raphael. My favorite is um, Winsor & Newton Series 7 brushes. That's a Winsor & Newton. That's a little bit large right now. I'm gonna go with my zero. And all these brushes, these brushes are 10 years old. Um, I, I beat up my brushes and they take a licking and keep on ticking. Um, was the old, what is it, Timex? Was the um, commercials that would talk about that? Okay, 
So I brought in some cadmium yellow. This is um, Hooker's Green and um, Viridian. Viridian is the blue green I use, um, and Hooker's Green or um, Permanent. Is it Hooker? Um, green are the two yellow greens I like to use. And usually what I do is on my palette, I will have a red version, or sorry, um, a warm version and a cool version of each of the primary colors. Your primary colors are basically your rainbow colors, red, green, yellow, um, blue, purple, and uh, orange. And um, the only one that I, I don't actually, I keep two reds, two yellows, um, three blues. The th and, um, the, <laughs> let me go through which ones I use. Um, I use um, cadmium yellow, cadmium red light, um, which is my um, yellow red. Um, alizarin crimson, alizarin crimson, say that 10 times fast, which is my, um, my, uh, blue red, uh, ultramarine, which is the, uh, blue to the blue side, <laughs> um, cobalt, um, which is blue to the slightly warm side, um, Prussian blue, which is a turquoise color, so that's blue to the warm side. Um, Viridian, which is your green to the cool side. Hooker's, um, or permanent green, which is your green to the yellow side. And uh, those are my main go-to colors um, in the um, chromatic palette. Then um, I have a variety of browns. Um, I don't like to mix my browns because I like the earth tones. They, they've got uh, a permanence to them, and um, you can count on them. Um, I use both um, burnt and raw sienna, burnt and raw umber. Those are my, uh, my go-to browns. And then sepia just because it, it makes so many pretty earth tones. Um, and then um, Payne's Gray is my go-to uh, blue-gray or black. And okay, what I'm doing right now is I laid down that green. It was a little bit too definite. So I'm going in with water and I'm blending that green into the blue in the background to give that more of a full shape. So that's why it, I just didn't, per se, like I'm doing that here too. I'm adding just water to give a little bit of variety in that background. Okay. Now I'm going to start playing with our, tri our uh, EO triceratops here. Now EO means early. The, this guy was like the biggest triceratops there was. It was during the Cretaceous period, and um, they just found, I guess, a complete skull of him in 2007, Alberta, Canada. It's like, um, from what I understand, the fields of Alberta are like the um, one of the greatest places for Cretaceous stuff. That was where they, I think, they found um, the best Tyrannosaurus skeleton in that area as well. Um, I'm not as up on, for to, for doing all these dinosaur paintings. I'm not up on a lot of my dinosaurs for a while. It's like I've got to start get going and finding the latest dinosaur books and adding to my library because I used to do tons and tons and tons of dinosaurs for a while, and then I got into storyboarding for animation for quite a bit. So I've I've, I've been lax on my knowledge of dinosaurs. Okay, so we're, what we're doing is we're just heavying up the. Uh, um, raw sienna here to get in the shadows 
and I'm going to blot that a little bit to keep the edging down. And then I think I'm going to go in with um, a little sepia. And maybe just a hint of... I'm going to take a little sepia. This is sepia here, and this is um, burnt sienna. Burnt sienna is a really red, red brown. Let's put it over here so you can see what I'm doing. So this is a real red brown that's um, burnt sienna, and I'm just going to pull in a little bit of sepia to get it a little bit more darker and give it... Um, how shall I say it? Um, basically... Um, there we go. That's a nice color. And that's a little bit dark, so I'm going to just blot it with a paper towel. And that blotting it with the paper towel will also give it a little bit of texture. It's pulling up the color and giving it a little texture at the same time. And if you, um, you'll find you can, depending on what you're using to blot with, I like to use, you know, a standard paper towel. You can also use toilet paper, but I think it absorbs too much. And I like the fact that paper towel gives a little bit of extra added texture. Okay, now, what do we want to do on markings on this guy? I'm thinking maybe come in with uh, the burnt sienna and, uh, or not the burnt sienna, I'm going to come in with the uh, sepia and maybe give him some spotting. just to give some interest because um, you wouldn't know you know some some uh, what type of uh, um, markings a dinosaur might have give them maybe a little striping here So the nice thing about when you're playing with dinosaurs, you can do whatever you want to in the marking department. Okay, I'm going to give him a little bit of a red eye, a little burnt sienna, and a little bit of, uh, I don't know, maybe just, eh, maybe sepia. Get a dark eye there. There we go. What do we want to do about that beak? Hmm. That's what I'm trying to think. You know, it's like with, with I'm thinking it's it's looking pretty cool the way it is. Um with um you know, when you're thinking um um ceratops that you might think um rhinoceros. I'm gonna take a little bit of purple. Basically, a little bit of violet. And I'm going to put, put it in the shadows here. I've got some schmutz of some kind on my... There we go. You'll notice I got a little... He there was like um, a little fuzz somehow got on the paper. And I used the um, brush to pick it away. Yeah, that kind of looks nice. Um, shadows often go into complement. Um, I like to use a color for a shadow. Your dark colors like purple or ultramarine makes a nice shadow. Um, uh, Prussian blue makes good shadows. Um, and a lizard and crimson make good shadows. I like to um, play with purple a lot for shadows. It goes purple. You got to be really careful when you're using violet or purple in your painting for the simple reason that it goes dark fast. 
Um, if you find that something went too dark on you, always you can just, for the most part, you can put water on it and pick it out. And now, because I've got purple here, I'm going to throw a few purple, little bit of purple into the shadows on the dinosaur as well. And that'll take, that'll give some harmonizing. So when you, you are painting, ah, got a little water on the. When you're painting, um, to give a composition an overall look, if you take a little bit of whatever color is out in the background and you throw it into the foreground, that always gives a harmonizing feel to your composition. So, if you're all yellow in the foreground, it, it'll it'll make it stark and it won't feel comfortable. <laughs> it's the best way I can describe it. And I think I've probably done too much there. So what I'm going to do is, once I lay down this puddle, I'll pull it out. Blink! Ta-da! It's amazing what a little... And if that was too light, I will go back in and throw some paint in there again. That's the thing. You can go back and forth with watercolor. All you have to do is know when, you know, pull it out with a little paper towel. And then if it's, if you pull too much out, put it back, put it back another darker color in with your, uh, yeah. It's like it got too dark there, and now it looks like it's getting a little too light. So I'm going to put a little, add a little purple there. And I think we're about done. And what I'll do is once this all, all dries, Um, and that's about it. Um, I will go in after this all dries and I might add just a few touch-ups here and there and I will go over the pen line again to thicken it up. Oh, and one last thing. Um, there's obviously this nice little piece of uh, black that's stuck out here. I'm literally slicing into the paper a little bit with the X-Acto knife. And I'm just going to scrape that away. And when this all dries again, I will go in with that with, an era with the kneaded eraser and the, uh, the latex again and clean that up. So this can be cleaned up. You can see there's a little bit of foxing in the area where we initially did that, that clean up earlier. But again, I will go in there with a the ballpoint pen and clean up those lines a bit. And nobody will ever know that there was really um, anything wrong there in the first place. And that's about it. There's your EO Triceratops. Hope you enjoyed the demonstration. And uh, do one for yourself. Thank you again for stopping by. My name is Lynn Hunter, L-L-Y-N-H-U-N-T-E-R. Um, please subscribe. I do one of these every week. And I'd appreciate your stopping by. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.